And hi there. I want to welcome everybody to today's Enterprise Data Visualization with Power BI. I see that we are now live um, and we have attendees ramping up as we're going. Uh, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, today is the third part in our series around the modern transformation, modern workforce transformation. And uh, if I scroll on down, you'll see here we are with enterprise data visualization with Power BI. Just as a reminder, uh, you can go to our site and we have the links tomorrow. We have uh, high risk, protecting high risk healthcare and life science data with identity and conditional access. And then we're going to close out on Friday with guarding the HLS gate or healthcare and life sciences gate with Microsoft threat intelligence. So we've had some great sessions already. Looking forward to a phenomenal one today. And I see, you know, while I was just talking, another 10 attendees jumped on. Great. And, uh, you know, share that with your friends and colleagues. I am going to go ahead and real quickly go through some housekeeping so that people know what to do. During today's session, we want to hear from you. Post your questions. You can, you know, give shout outs, you know, maybe give us your first name and where you're from. We'd love to hear all that. We'll respond to you promptly. I'll be monitoring the moderated Q&A. So you can go ahead and do that to go ahead and post questions during the session, as well as to, you know, just give a shout out and say hello. Simply go in your browser or in your Microsoft Teams to the upper right hand corner. You'll see a little dialog box with a question mark. When you click that, that will open the live event Q&A. You can post questions, you can put your name or you can go anonymous. We don't really care. We just want to hear from you. Um, we'd love to field your questions. So go ahead during today's session and do that. Today's session is also being recorded at the close of the session. Um, later this afternoon, I'll be posting the recording up to the website for healthcare and life sciences for Microsoft. With the, having said all that, um, I'm going to let Amir introduce himself and his colleague. But Amir, if uh, you want to share your desktop, I'll go ahead and queue you up. And we're going to send that on over to show. And without further ado, I want to introduce Amir Nets. And Amir, if you want to introduce yourself and your colleague and take it away. Uh, good morning, Mike, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it is 9 a.m. here in Redmond, Washington. I am Amir Nets, and I'm a technical fellow at Microsoft. I'm the CTO of Power BI. We'll talk a lot about Power BI uh, today. I will be joined uh, with uh, two colleagues of mine, Christina and Christian, and they will come back some of the demos you're going to see. Uh, I've been at Microsoft for 22 years, been doing BI pretty much all this time. Uh, and, uh, BI is a, is a, is a very uh, uh, large area of investment for Microsoft, and we've been in this business for a couple of decades. And the last uh, few years have been incredibly transformation for the BI business. So we'll talk a lot about Power BI. Um, I assume that you guys have some basic knowledge of BI and of Power BI. Power BI is, uh, has been on an incredible tier over the last uh, four years. Uh, it's basically being used everywhere. Uh, I don't, you, may not be, uh, you may not be using it yourself, but I'm almost certain somebody in the organization is using it already. Uh, our, our penetration, our adoption across the uh, Fortune 500 companies right now is in the high 90s. Uh, we are uh, seeing incredible momentum. We'll talk about that. Power BI really you know, was introduced just uh, less than four years ago. Um, and within this very short period of time, we were able to go and take a massive leadership position in the industry uh, with uh, incredible adoption across the board. Uh, you can see here the Gartner uh, Magic Quadrant, and you can see where Microsoft is positioned. There's a new Magic Quadrant that is about to be published soon. And uh, I think that uh, you'll see that the momentum continues. Uh, you, uh, we, it became a very, very large business for Microsoft. You can see here from Satya that talks about just uh, last winter, talked about how Power BI within such a short period of time has grown to become a very substantial business for, uh, for Microsoft. And we are now, we have just closed the year and uh, 
and I think I just projected the wrong deck. So hold on, uh, this is the right deck. So we just we just closed uh, we just closed another year here, um, and uh, it's been another incredible year of a triple digit growth uh, in, in virtually every dimension. So I'll just switch to here. Um, so. At, at the basis of uh, of uh, what we do here at, uh, at at Power BI is is a vision. It's a vision that we talk about as the data culture vision. A data culture vision is a vision where every organization is uh, has it, it, its employees driven by data. Everybody's data literate. Everybody has a tool to work with data. Everybody is valued based on what they know rather than who they know, where uh, information trumps opinions, uh, where uh, reports replaces PowerPoints. And, uh, and, and this vision of ours to really get every employee to have that tools to really uh, uh, drive data-driven decisions has been something that has really brought, brought us this, this incredible momentum and incredible adoption and we really designed from the ground up the whole product to support that vision. And as I said, we, we didn't start from scratch. We actually had significant uh, IP to start with. As you know, we were working for two decades in the BI space, uh, leaders in the magic quadrants for over a decade. Um, but when we started, we said we're going to go and uh, with, with this vision, we said we want to go and really bet on this massive adoption with frictionless uh, process for every employee to go and within five seconds to be able to sign up to the product, five minutes to get their data and, and get inside and say, wow, that's that's super cool. So we made a huge bet on the cloud. We'll talk more about the cloud. The cloud is, is a critical uh, element of, of our strategy and of the product value proposition. So frictionless adoption, build a single global system uh, for BI, and that's very unique, and people sometimes don't understand what it means to have a single global system for BI. It means that you, when you sign up to Power BI, it's like signing up to Facebook. It means that you are connected to everybody else immediately. You don't install your own virtual machine that is isolated from everything, everybody else. There cannot be two Power BI systems within the same organization. There's only one Power BI system in the whole world, where all the data, whoever is using data, loading data, uh, creating reports, creating analysis, sharing with everybody else, it's all in the same place. There are no silos, no barriers, no architectural separation. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you are, what company you are, you're all running on the same system. And that means that there is just no data that is hidden. Everything is governed together. Everything is connected together. You can share the, the thing that separates people from data is security and permissions and privacy, but it's not architecture, it's not geography. Um, so that that made a huge difference. Um, this, this kind of Facebook-like approach to how to connect all the data together. The other thing that really was, uh, and I, I have to say, because sometimes we don't like to talk about it, but, uh, but in this case, it was a very deliberate act of creating disruptive economics. When we released Power BI just a few years ago, Power BI was released about, at about one tenth of the price of the competitors. And that was very intentional. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, viewed as a way to really make sure that every employee can get uh, their hands on, on BI. Uh, BI until then was really the, the, the realm of business analysts, uh, people who are high, paid high, uh, high salaries and you can invest in them to give them very extensive tools. But if you really want to get to every employee in the company, we, re we had to drop the prices to by, by an order of magnitude. And uh, we've done that and that's really drove uh, incredible adoption. Uh, and today Power BI is by far the most used BI product in the world. In addition, we are the, the ability to relate to uh, our cloud deployment model allows us to uh, adopt a rapid innovation cycle that is unprecedented. Usually every week we release new features on the service. Every month we release a new release, a, a new version of our desktop tool, and everything is going through a very closed loop um, cycle with our community, our community of users. We'll talk more about those. Um, 
it's, it's a gigantic community that votes for their features and those votes determine what we're building. So within you know this this constant release of features that are driven by the community has given us this incredible strength of a product is really becoming uh, really hand to glove uh, uh, experience for for our users. So as I said, it is it is in the cloud. We are by far the largest cloud based BI tool in the world, I'm talking about by orders of magnitude. We are in 34 data centers worldwide, 43 languages. We are in, in individual national cloud uh, in the US, in the China, in Germany. We have virtually every possible certificate um, around uh, under the sun. I think we have like 34 certificate, uh, certificates here. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, incredible uh, ecosystem and community. I can see uh, the adoption of the exponential adoption of the partner community, the rich offering around it. Uh, the user community has- One second, uh, Amir. Yes. Just, I saw we had a number of more people that, that jumped on. If you have questions and wanna post those so that I can queue those up for later for Amir, go up to the upper right-hand corner of your browser or your client, you'll see a little uh, dialog box with a question mark on it. It's in between the leave and the gear. If you click that, it'll open the live Q&A panel and you can post your questions and shout outs there. I'm sorry for interrupting. I just saw we had a number of new people and I wanted to make sure they knew that. That's great. Um, so a very, very strong community. What do you see here? The number on the screen almost eight. Uh, now we have over 800,000 community members uh, that these are people that not just users, these are people who are active, means that they are going, they're publishing blogs, they're going and, and, and proposing features and voting for features and organizing, organizing events. Uh, incredible passion community that is helping us drive the product. Um, and uh, you can see they, this community submitted 16,000 ideas for features. Uh, about 3,000 are, are active, means that they are still uh, in the backlog under development. We've been shipping hundreds of those features. In fact, if you look at this uh, chart at this table here, what you see here is just the number of features we have been shipping every month. This is just the first five months of 2018. Uh, this is the next five months of 2018, nonstop innovation. It's virtually impossible to go and review each one of those features. So I thought I'll I'll distill what happened in the next in the last 12 months into into three three buckets. The first thing is what we call self-service maturity. Uh, the second is what is the mass enterprise adoption we've been experiencing and the, uh, we'll understand the why, what we're seeing. And the last one is where we're heading in the future, some of the amazing investments that we're making. So um, let's talk about self-service maturity. What do we mean by that? RBI was released as a self-service BI tool. Self-service BI tools mean that it's designed for business analysts and Users of Excel essentially go and collect their data and uh, organize the data, clean the data, uh, create beautiful reports and dashboards and share with others. And they can do it all without anybody, uh, anybody from IT needing to, need to help them. And uh, when we released the, our product about three years ago, we were kind of behind the curve. It was a young product competing with a very mature and very uh, powerful uh, competitors. Um, and we had a bunch, a bunch of uh, uh, features to catch up with. But over the last year, we, we really were uh, beyond that catch up mode. We were able to invest on some really cutting edge features and really go and morph the product into what we call the PowerPoint for data. And we'll see what it means PowerPoint for data. Big investment in personalization, big investment in collaboration between people. So let me just give you a kind of a glimpse of what we mean by that. So uh, one of the things that we have done is we have been investing greatly in, uh, in natural language. The ability to go and just type what you want. Say, so I want to see just the claims by, uh, by, by uh, speciality and just immediately get it on the screen. You don't need to know how to, to morph a query. You don't have to even to navigate the list of fields to put them in there. You just type what you want in English and the things show up. And that's just beautiful. Um, 
the ability to go and, and get this amazing pivot table like experiences in the, in the, in the BI tool. The ability to go and use not uh, use uh, artificial intelligence to go and explain where the increases or decreases in the data are coming from. In this case, we asked to see why, uh, where the increase in the last year is coming from, and you can see how the the system immediately gives you different possibilities of uh, uh, of, of where the, the 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 changes are coming from, and you just edit to the report. Uh, we, uh, the, uh, new experiences for filtering. New experiences for uh, for, uh, transform, for data preparations. One of the things that is uh, beautiful about uh, about Power BI, about Power BI is data preparation is the uh, ability to uh, use AI in conjunction with the data preparation. In this case, what you're seeing is that the user is simply typing the uh, the result they would like to get for the data cleansing. And the system will figure out what expression is needed in order to generate those results. This, this kind of show me what you want to get and I'll tell you what expression and what transformations are needed is, is very unique and incredibly powerful use of AI. The, uh, similarly, uh, we are providing uh, in the data preparation some incredible uh, data profiling capability allowing you to, go to, to get some uh, information about distributions and outlines and errors uh, in a very, very visual way. As I mentioned, a lot of what we do is about making Power BI into the PowerPoint of data. And you can see here Power BI report and just change the themes to change the colors and the, and, the, and the look of the product is just like with PowerPoint. You just go change the theme uh, and, and just uh, affect it. Similar to PowerPoint, you can also play around with the uh, back with the wallpaper. Uh, so you see here a report, but maybe this report is about environmental uh, impact. So we can make it look like environmental impact report, or maybe it's about the city of London and we can make it look like that. And this, this ability to really make the report be look as, as, a, as, a, as beautiful and as reflecting to the spirit of the topic you are uh, you're in uh, is, is incredibly powerful and people love this kind of PowerPoint-like uh, experiences. And of course, if you love you know, PowerPoint, you know these kind of experiences. These smart guidelines just allow you to very easily lay out your data uh, in, the, in the best possible way, uh, which altogether creates uh, this incredible richness of ability to use colors and shapes and uh, organization uh, to create this collage of, of reports that you see here on the screen. Another big area of investment have been around the collaboration and personalization. What you see here is the homepage we introduced in the poll. This is just a place that is personalized to every employee where they can find the dashboards and reports and applications that they are using uh, most often. The system is smart to recommend to them what else they should be using by looking at what their peers are, are using. Um, the ability to go and subscribe to results on a regular basis. So you can say, I would like to get Every morning, this report delivered to my mailbox. Um, the ability to collaborate using comments around the dashboards and the reports, uh, so you can have dialogues, discussions around it, and the ability to create your own personalized views with what we call personal bookmarks, where you can create uh, the uh, the right slices of data that are right for you, save them, and then they're yours. The report is, is your filters, your visualizations. So. This is kind of some of the uh, real win uh, tour, some of the work that we've been doing in the advanced self service capabilities. But, and the next thing, you know, it, it, but the, the work that we've been doing are not limited just to the self service. Uh, on the browser, we have, a much, we have matured incredibly uh, around other form factors. Uh, our mobile application right now has about 50,000 reviews with an average score of, uh, it used to be 4.5, now it's a, it's 4.7 on the Apple Ice, uh, on, on the Apple uh, App Store. This is uh, uh, 50 times more, re many more reviews than any of our competitors combined. Uh, we are the first BI vendor to release an augmented reality application for BI. It's pretty incredible. You put these goggles on your head and those dashboards and reports are floating in front of you. And it's, it's great for those people who need to use their hands uh, for other things while they need to look at the data. Uh, and if you're in healthcare, nurses, doctors. Um, 
And then uh, the, the, the work that we've been doing with, uh, with developers to build a customized solution with Harvey embedded. We have about 3,900 ISVs that uh, some of the, the best names like G Healthcare, for example, is a great partner of ours. PwC is a great partner of ours. Uh, and they're all using Power BI as ingredient into their application. So that's kind of a little bit of what we've been doing uh, in terms of the uh, feature set and the uh, and, and maturing the product uh, and, and really getting us this leadership position will be happy day. But the other thing that we've been seeing in the last year is this mass enterprise adoption. And uh, it, it's today Power BI is virtually everywhere. Uh, there's almost no Fortune 500 company that is not using Power BI in some capacity, but many of them have been going to the very, very large deployments. Uh, and it was driven by an offering that we call Power BI Premium. Uh, and it's worthwhile talking about Power BI Premium because it's really changed the landscape on and, and the affordability of BI across the board and uh, supported by this very strong governance feature, which I think you, and we'll talk more about governance uh, later on in the presentation, but I, I know that in healthcare, this is one of the most important things. So uh, let's talk a bit about what does it mean, and what, what, what is Power BI Premium, and why it was so transformational. So when we released Power BI, uh, we released it with a price point of uh, $9.95 per, per month per user, which was, as I said, an order of magnitude lower price than what the competitors were charging at that point in time. It's also the free desktop tool, which is you know the, the analyst tool with the competitor charging two thousand dollars per seat. We gave it for free, uh, but when, when yeah you know, we got this amazing adoption uh, in the first wave. But when we wanted to go broader, and companies said I, I want to to have it available to one hundred thousand employees, two hundred thousand employees, then even the ten dollar per user per month was was team as an obstacle. They did it. Our customer demanded a licensing model that uh, really was optimized for a very broad distribution that truly every employee, uh, no matter what they do, it could be anywhere from the CEO to the receptionist, all of them can use Power BI. So we, based on this demand for this wide distribution licensing model, we introduced Power BI premium. And instead of licensing on a per user basis, we licensed by the core. And it was, and it's, it's, it's coming with an, an incredible price point. This is, uh, what I'm showing here is, uh, is a price, and it's about $5,000 a month, and our accommodation that is about 1,500 users um, be, be using this uh, basic, the, the most common uh, SKU that we have, which comes down to about $3, under $3 per month, which is kind of a couple of flat per, per employee per month. And with this kind of price point, and with an incredible set of additional features, which are exclusive to this, uh, that are really designed for the enterprise, exclusive to these large organizations, whether they are the large model sizes, or the big go deployed on multiple geographies, or very large storage is built in. The result was an explosive growth that we've seen in the, in, during 2018. Um, companies from every possible industry has been adopting it, um, and as I said, it's virtually everywhere today. Uh, but the, the broad adoption uh, of premium uh, was specifically was incredible. We had a 7x growth uh, during 2018. Uh, we had uh, this led to, to 100,000 applications being uploaded to the product every day. We are processing now over 10 million queries per hour and 10 petabytes of data is uploaded into the Power BI service every month. This is kind of scale that we're talking here. And that scale actually that we have is what also allows us to drop the prices to, uh, to a couple of flat per employee. And because we can, we got to these economies of scale where we are so optimized and, and we are so streamlined that we can afford to give it at, at, the, at, the, at the price that is at this point one thirtieth of what the prices used to be. And the result is that now we're seeing organizations are standardizing on Power BI, and uh, and and this really uh, got us to the next phase where we're we're working now. Not you know, Power BI started from in the, in the world of uh, self service. We're seeing now incredible engagement from IT organizations that want to adopt it in, in a very broad way. And this is where really the whole, uh, 
the whole next phase of Power BI is, is centered on. And this is the what we call the future of modern BI. And to really get organizations to get to this data culture, we really need to move the organization to the next phase. And, and this is what we, uh, what we call the, the network effect. We need to get to a position where the more users are touching BI, the more data there is in BI, then more users, more data will join. This network effect or, uh, or, or uh, viral adoption is something that uh, we are really uh, focusing on. Uh, we actually had it at Microsoft. Microsoft today has 100,000 employees using the product uh, every month. This is out of 120,000, uh, over 80% adoption rate. Uh, this is today Power BI is used in Microsoft more than PowerPoint is being used at Microsoft. It's pretty incredible. And uh, but to get to this network effect, we really need to uh, to make sure that when an employee joins Power BI, they can find all the data that they need. They can share with, with everyone else, and they can form together a community of data literate uh, employees in in a way that is unrestricted. And the problem today is that virtually every significant organization has this this fragmentation of products where you have products that are coming from different vendors, each product has its own strength. Some are better for self service, some they are for enterprise, some of for, for small data, some of for big data, some of for more for AI, some of more for BI. And this fragmentation across products and it creates silos, silos that prevent people from uh, finding all the data that they need in one place, from sharing with everybody else because other people are on a different product. And this is what we're trying to solve with this, uh, with, with the roadmap of, uh, of RBI and the roadmap that we are actually delivering on already. So um, we treat this fragmentation something that is fundamental that we need to solve. And to do that, we are investing heavily on creating a unified global BI platform that every organization, workable can scale, can use. You don't need to fragment. You don't need to use different products. You can have just one product that does it all. And so we, we're looking at three dimensions of unification when creating one product. One is to create a single platform for both self-service BI and enterprise BI. So that is the self-service BI driven by the business units and the analysts, and enterprise BI that is typically driven by, by IT and the BI center of excellence, and the data, uh, the chief data officer. Single platform, and both can find what they want. Um, and and What's beautiful about what where Microsoft is coming from is that we have this very strong self-service, self-power BI offering, but we've been doing enterprise BI for two decades before that with SQL Server Analysis Services and SQL Server Reporting Services. So we see how we're going to bring all of it together. The other thing that we are uh, working on is bringing together big data and transactional data, IT and business users into a single unified store with what we call data prep for the unified data lake. This is an incredibly strategic motion that is uh, highly transformational. We'll talk more about that. And the last unification effort that we have is bringing together AI and BI. Uh, and we'll see, and this is one of the most exciting things, and Justina is going to give us quite a lot of demos around it, but uh, we'll see what it really means to empower every employee with the power of AI as they go and analyze data, as they go and understand data. So let's start with the first motion, the unified platform for self-service and enterprise BI. As I said, Power BI started with a, a, a self-service uh, tool, and as such, it has the cell service BI models where business, business analysts can go and collect data from everywhere and clean it and organize it and then use it to create these interactive reported dashboards. But while cell service BI models uh, are, are very important, they also kind of were designed for simplicity and ease of use because they're designed to be used by non-professionals. But what we're doing now is we're bringing the full power of SQL Server Analysis Services into this enterprise-grade semantic models. Well, what are the enterprise-grade semantic models? This is these are models that really represent the full the full uh, dimensionality of the data in the organization. Um, they are typically much more complex. They could have hundreds of tables with them with complex relationship, sometimes with thousands of measures, and uh, they're large, they're complex, they need to be authorized, they need to be certified, 
Uh, and and we have this, this asset called SQL Server Analysis Services that we are bringing the full power into Power BI, and which means also that it's compatible with all these SQL Server Analysis Services that are installed in the organization. We have hundreds of thousands of those servers out there, and all these assets, all the power that you have, and all the knowledge that you have, and all the IP that you accumulated building those models in the organization can now be completely compatible with Power BI. So, um, so we're going to do a demo of that, but uh, in, the other thing that we are investing heavily in uh, is in the area of, uh, and of uh, enterprise reporting. Uh, this is where we are bringing the power of, of uh, enterprise reports with SQL Server reporting services in the Power BI. These are pixel perfect paginated reports that can have scheduled delivery and you know, personalized filters. Uh, and supports all the kind of formats that we have. And again, completely compatible with this 100,000 SQL Server reporting services that are installed inside the organization. And lastly, we are invent, investing in uh, enterprise uh, governance for management and control. Something I know in healthcare is critical. And this is where we are. It's, it's about making sure that the data stays in the right geography, that you have proper lineage and impact analysis, uh, auditing and usage tracking, and and, and powerful application lifecycle management. And to demonstrate uh, a bunch of those things, I'm going to ask uh, Christian Wade, I hope he's online, uh, to go and give us a demo. Are you there, Christian? Yes, I am. Can you yes, hear me? Yes, okay. so Christian, if you want to share your desktop, yes, I'll make I it will. live. This is Mike. And just as a reminder to those who are attending uh, the broadcast today, if you take a look in the upper right hand corner of either your web browser or the team's client you'll see a little dialog box with a question mark on it if you mouse over it'll say q a and you can click on that open it and we've been getting questions i have a bunch of them that i've i have teed up for our q a portion you can continue to post those out there and if you want to give any shout outs as well say where you're call, you know watching from would love that as well so christian you're live Thank you very much. Can you see my desktop? Can you see these tables in Power BI Desktop? I see a desktop right okay. now. Uh, it says Amir's desktop. You need to share yours. OK, let me try this. Uh, there we go. OK, perfect. We're in business. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, Happy New Year. So as Amir said, we are bringing the full power of analysis services and reporting services to Power BI to have a single all-inclusive platform that works for both self-service and enterprise BI workloads, like a one-stop shop, right? And as Amir said, we have a rich history in enterprise BI with analysis services and reporting services. Now, one of the things that we see with analysis services models. These are enterprise models and the point being that they are widely reused throughout an enterprise organization and therefore they grow in scale and complexity. And it's not uncommon to have these models have potentially 50 or 100 or 150 tables with complex relationships and lots of business logic and KPIs and uh, display folders and user hierarchies and all this, this rich, these rich definitions built into the semantic model. So to that end, we recently delivered the uh, uh, new modeling view. It's in public preview right now. It should reach general available availability pretty soon. So that's what you're looking at here. So as you can see, I have uh, almost 100 tables in this uh, model and uh, just little details that make the life of the business intelligence professional so much easier. For example, we can break out the uh, diagram into separate subject areas. We can create new diagrams. Uh, if I bring in one of these tables and if I make this table nice and big, you can see that, you know, Th this defines the user interface that the business users will see when they're creating reports. You know, we've got spaces in the column names and, you know, user hierarchies, etc. So I'm going to go ahead and add the related tables. And one of the things we did with this new modeling view is the ability to multi-select objects and set common properties in one go. So in this case, I'm going to multi-select some columns and I'm going to set the display folder 
as a common property for these three columns. I'm going to call this one find me easily. And so display folders are actually something that has been in analysis services for over a decade um, because Power BI ultimately runs on analysis services. So we're just surfacing the analysis services features. And uh, display folders are precisely to allow consumers of these complex models to find what they're looking for easily. And they are part of the kind of business logic that is embedded in the semantic model for reusability and ease of access of non-technical business users to access the data that they need to make uh, effective decisions. OK, so that is the new modeling view. And that displays uh, uh, some of the work we're doing around managing complex models. Now, the next feature that I'm going to show you um, is for large scale models. So as we said earlier, uh, these enterprise models, they grow in complexity and scale because they are reused throughout an enterprise organization. So this is a new feature that really uh, redefines the boundaries of what is possible uh, in terms of scalability. This really takes uh, scalability to the next level and really unlocks massive data sets, unlocks big data uh, in enterprise organizations in a way that was really not possible before. Um, so here we have this data set and everything looks completely normal right now, but you'll, you'll see what, I, what I'm talking about in just a moment. So this data set is for uh, data from a crowdsourced courier service where a smartphone app emits the driver's locations and generates a ton of data. So each row in the driver activity table represents an individual location emitted by the app. And this location count measure, as you can see, is simply the count of the rows in the table. So everything looks completely normal at this point. And I'm gonna casually drag this measure onto the canvas to see how many rows we have in here. And lo and behold, we actually have over a trillion rows of data. You know, I've seen uh, uh, demos where uh, we are, uh, are showing the, the, the scalability of, of scalable enterprise BI platforms and set, you know, reaching a billion rows or 10 billion rows. We've actually just completely blown those thresholds out of the water. We're at over a trillion. This is actually a quarter of a petabyte, a uh, quarter of a petabyte of data uh, from a 23 node HDI Spark cluster. But the point being is that I just got an instant response time. You know, it's one thing saying I've got a big data system with, you know, multiple petabytes of data. It's another thing that just click and drag and drop and instantly create reports with instant response times, which is what's happening here. And I'm going to continue. I'm going to uh, break out the travel distance, uh, break it out by the date. I'm going to make it nice and big. I'm going to make it a bar chart. I'm going to break it out by the miles per job. I'm going to go ahead and filter it just by the drivers who left the company. As you see, I'm just getting instant response times. This should, for all intents and purposes, be physically po impossible if you know how the underlying technology works. You know, we cache the data into memory in Power BI um, and analysis services, and uh, uh, that's what gives us this blazing fast performance. However, quarter of a petabyte is a lot of data to cache into memory. So what we're doing is we're doing a little trick here, which I'm just about to explain. So I'm going to go ahead and cross filter this by December 23rd. I'm going to break out the location count uh, and make this a table uh, showing the, the driver names. So I've interactively over a quarter of a petabyte of data created a list of drivers who worked on December 23rd, performed jobs of over 50 miles and subsequently left the organization. And up until now, everything's been super fast because we've been hitting this in-memory aggregated cache, right? Whereas now I'm going to drill through all the way down to the detail level. So this report is going to plot the individual locations, the few hundred rows from the one uh, trillion row table from HDI Spark. At this point, there is no aggregated cache. The, we're using this aggregations feature that caches the data at the aggregated level. And if the user happens to drill down to the detail level, there is no cache. So what then? Do they need to learn sparse SQL or run a different report? No, there's a seamless experience. It's just going to have to submit a direct query to the 23 node HDI Spark cluster, which is what it's doing right now. 
so we should be able to see this query running. And bear in mind, this is uh, 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 this has a, a trillion rows in it, um, so it just takes a few seconds. Um, and it's almost, I think it's done already. Uh, so here you can see the query that was just submitted, and there's the filter and Christian, we can't hear you. Your audio dropped. I think his video is open. Yeah, he might have. Uh, I think it might have been his audio and video. He sounded a little choppy. Um, let me message him directly. And. That's the beauty of being in here in Teams. You can just toggle back and forth. So we had, we actually had questions about his audio. So Christian appears to have, I, I don't know what happened. Um, are you, Christian, are you there? Nope. So I'm going to push my fate. There we go. So I'm filling here. Um, Amir, I didn't know if Justina was going to do any demonstrations. She will, but they will get to it in a moment. Uh, okay. So All right. Let me just, uh, let's turn over back to me. So Christian wanted to, so I'm just going to uh, fill in the blank for what Christian was about to finish. It was, he was like, like 15 seconds from the end of his demo. Uh, but Christian was going to show that uh, as we drill down from the details to the, uh, from the summary to the details, we, Run the query in HGI Spark, and then the result, um, the, the result, the query was run transparently in HGI Spark. The result was showing up in the Power BI um, report, and no, uh, with in that this transition from in-memory cache to the HGI Spark is transparent, and the user just get the results. And that's really kind of the beauty of being able to work with trillions of rows uh, in Power BI with the combination of Power BI and big data. So let me just go and switch to my back to my screen um, and tell me if you see my stuff. And I'm going to add it right now. There we go. Sending yours over to live. There you go. You are live. So uh, the, I would say the other thing that Christian would have shown is the pixel perfect reporting that we have in Power BI, but uh, we'll skip that unless Christian can join us later and finish his other demo. Um, but um, what we have really, uh, with the ability to add the full power of this workhorse, SQL Server Analysis Services, and the other workhorse, SQL Server Reporting Services, in a compatible way to Power BI, it allows organizations that have those hundreds and sometimes thousands of those servers that today are installed everywhere, sometimes in data centers, sometimes on the people's desk, uh, that each of them is individual, siloed, ungoverned, often costed to maintain. It's ev everywhere in every organization. Now with this Power BI coming in the cloud that is fully compatible with those servers, we <laughs> offer uh, the ability to go and modernize your whole BI infrastructure by simply migrating from on-premise to the cloud into a single system that has infinite scale and no silos and it's fully governed and fully compatible with what we have before. It actually costs you less than maintaining those servers uh, that you have to do on premises. So uh, both modernizing and consolidating and costless, you know, how can you beat that kind of value proposition? So I want to switch to the, to the next pillar of innovation that we're working on, which is the data prep for the unified database. Uh, and, and here we introduced uh, just uh, over a month ago a, a new concept called a data flows. Uh, data flows are repeatable and reusable ETL processes that are designed for business analysts to create. Uh, it is using the familiar Power Query experience. I don't know if you guys have been using Power Query, but tens of millions have. It is an integral part of Excel. This is how you, you know, this is the how you bring data into Excel. It's, you know, I remember when I started uh, uh, 
uh, in the 90s, I used MS Query to get data into Excel. Today, use Power Query, which is an unbelievable experience. We have tens of millions of users. It is shared between Power Excel and Power BI, it's exactly the same experience. And it's actually designed, it's incredibly powerful, it's designed the most complex challenges. Um, and the beautiful thing about the, the data flow is that it's operating on top of the Azure data lake. So let's understand first what does it mean to to uh, to have uh, to be designed for the most complex challenges. Uh, Power Query has over 300 transformations supporting uh, actually today's close to 100 data sources. It is designed for uh, data flows are designed for creating projects that are comprised of uh, cross project and multi of uh, multi authors. Um, and one of the most beautiful things about it is that it has this revolutionary computation engine that handles all the registration that is, is, uh, that is around data transformation and cleansing, uh, which ensures full data consistency. And I'm, now, what is this revolutionary computation engine? The best way to think about it is to think about the Excel calculation engine. Compare Excel to program. If you are doing programming, you have to handle the variable, you know, you have variables that you store data in them, and you have lines of code that code manipulate the variables and compute new variables out of the other variables. And you are responsible for writing the lines of code in the right order so the computations are done for you in, uh, correctly. Uh, and not, not to, you have to remember every possible condition and make sure that it's accounted for in every possible way. And then you have Excel where you, you don't have to write any line of code, you just write the expressions and the system figure out on itself what is the order of the computation and how to do it in the right way that is always going to give you the right result. What we've done with data flows is exactly the same thing. All your transformations are actually built through these M transforms. Uh, this is the language behind Power Query that is just like Excel. It's an expression language. We analyze it, we understand the dependencies between the transformations, and we orchestrate it the same way Excel is orchestrated the calculation across cells. And this ensures, just like with Excel, that you cannot make mistakes. At least the mistakes cannot be because you did things in the wrong order or forgot some, forgot some stuff. We figure out automatically all the order, the, the flow, the, uh, the exceptions, and manage it all for you and just allow people that don't have any experience in building computational systems um, to, to use data flows to in the same ease of use of Excel. So that's the revolution of computation engine. The other thing that is super cool about, uh, about the data flow is that it's operating on top of the Azure data lake, which really means is that when you're using data flows, every piece of data that you are uh, ingesting into Power BI, uh, every piece of data that you are transforming on is all happening in this Azure data lake, which is shared across many other uh, systems. So the data is not siloed and not isolated inside Power BI, but the data is sitting in the Azure Data Lake, and it is, uh, and you can the same the data that is brought from Power BI within Power BI to the Data Lake can be used in other Azure services such as the uh, Azure Data Factory or Azure Machine Learning or Azure Data Warehousing or Azure Data Bricks. Uh, can connect the same data, can process the data, and put it back in the data lake, and Power BI can read it. We have a shared format for both metadata and data that is shared across all the Azure services and Power BI and Dynamics 365 and Office 365 and a host of partners, including Adobe and SAP that are working with us on an initiative called the One Data Initiative that will have one common format for all these systems, both for data, data and metadata, aligned collaboration uh, across across uh, uh, the different products, across the personas, business analysts with data engineers and with data scientists, uh, all through this one store that has no, that, that one store that is virtually infinite in scale and in size that can handle all your data. So the data is not siloed, the data can be collaborated on, and the only thing that separates the data from people is permissions rather than architecture. So that's uh, incredibly exciting. And I'm going to uh, ask Justina to give us a taste of uh, Power Query and data flows. So Justina, we're going to transition to you. Yeah, so Justina, if you want to share your desktop. Sure, um, so I'm doing that just now. Let me know when you're able to see. You're live. Awesome. 
All right, so over here, um, I'm inside the Power BI service, and you know, you've got your dashboards, you've got your reports, but now we see we've got this new tab over here called data flows. And over here are a bunch of existing data flows that I've, I've gone ahead and already created. But let's go ahead and actually create a data flow from scratch to see what the process looks like. So I'm gonna click on this create button over here. Again, I can create, you know, and offer new dashboards reports, and I can just create new data flows in the same way. And I'm gonna start from completely from scratch. I wanna go ahead and define new entities. So when I click on this new on this button, you know, this this interface that you see over here should look pretty familiar. Similarly to how the Power BI I can go ahead and connect to multiple different data sources. Over here, I can go ahead and start my data flow, for example, from connecting to Azure SQL database. So I'm going to go ahead right now and connect to uh, connect to Azure SQL. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and copy the cool credentials over here. And I'm going to select uh, a particular table inside this Azure database. Um, so I'm going to select um, this over here, which is representing a, a number of different hotel reviews. So in this scenario, let's pretend I'm a hotel manager. Uh, you know, we could apply, apply this scenario to multiple different things. So if we think about healthcare, we could be looking at a number of different hospitals. And I'm loading in some data that's showing me uh, basically information about various reviews that are coming from my guests uh, for a number of different hotels. And again, this interface should look very similar. Uh, it's basically leveraging the Power Query technology, but putting it inside the Power BI browser. Um, I can do transformations just like I can in Power Query. For example, over here, if I want to change this to, let's say, just the date, I can just do that. A new step gets created on the right-hand side over here. And at any point, as I'm doing my various transformations, I can go ahead and actually see, go into Advanced Editor and see all of the different M steps that have been uh, generated. So again, if you're familiar with Power BI and Power Query, when I'm transforming my data inside my Power BI desktop file, these are the same steps that are getting generated, except this time they're being generated inside a data flow. And this is a very, very important distinction because when I'm, got, when I'm basically done and I've created all of the different transformations inside my data flow and I click done and I go ahead and save this, and I'm going to just save this as let's say here. What I have done basically is created a reusable ETL flow that now I can reuse in multiple different scenarios. Beforehand, when I created uh, my Power Query transformations inside my Power BI desktop file, those were locked to my Power BI desktop file. So I could for sure you know, publish it into the service, but if I wanted to share my work with others and you know, have them build their own reports, for example, on top of the transformations I have done, I would not be able to do that. I would not be able to build multiple reports on top of that same, um, essentially that same, those Power Query steps. With data flows, you're able to do all of that because all those transformations now essentially live inside the Power BI service and we have decoupled the data preparation from the reporting. So now there's multiple different avenues I can take. I can take this hotel reviews data flow and uh, use it on top of other data flows. And I'll show you guys more complex data flows and what those look like in just a second. I could connect to it in from the Power BI desktop and create own, my own reports and others could do the same as well. But Amir mentioned a really important point over here where this all of this data is actually being stored inside Azure Data Lake. And uh, if you start out with data flows, uh, you know, it's a completely frictionless and seamless experience. We have an inbuilt Azure Data Lake directly inside Power BI, so you don't need any sort of you know, Azure subscription to get started. It's a completely frictionless process. But at some point, as you're getting all of this data into Power BI, you're going to want to do more. You're going to want to collaborate with your data scientists. You're going to want to collaborate with your data engineers. Similarly, work that's being done inside Azure, you may want to be able to leverage directly inside Power BI. So at any point you want, you can go ahead and essentially, it's as simple as flicking a switch inside Power BI and configuring uh, the data flows storage to actually be your own Azure subscription. So in this case, we can actually see that the, that data flow storage location isn't the inbuilt Azure data lake inside Power BI, but it's my own storage that I have gone ahead and configured. So it's sitting inside my own Azure subscription. And we can actually take a look at this. We can go ahead and jump into the Azure Storage Explorer. So I'm gonna bring that up over here. And you can see that this is uh, CVSA, BYOSA, DAV, you know, this is the basically the location. 
So I'm going to ju jump ahead into my Azure subscription over here. I'm going to go and basically uh, find the same data lake that we, we're seeing over here. And I'm going to se select the Power BI one. And what you're seeing over here is actually all of the different workspaces that are available to me from directly inside Power BI. So I'm going to scroll down and uh, I'm actually inside the Ingest Dynamics workspace. I'm going to double click into that. And you will see the same data flow I just created has appeared over here as a new CDM folder. So if I double click into this, what you'll actually see is both the data sitting inside one of these folders, but also a model.json uh, definition file. So let's just actually download this and take a look at what this looks like. So I'm going to actually just select my documents folder over here. And what you'll see is essentially a description of all of the data that's basically sitting inside this data flow. So if I jump into my documents over here, just bear with me one second, and I'm going to just double click this and I'm going to open it with Notepad. And let's make this a little bit prettier because right now this is uh, looking a little bit hard to read. So I'm going to just uh, format the JSON over here. And you basically see what I've gone ahead and created. So you see the definition of the entities. You can see I've created this hotel reviews entity. And you can see all of the different attributes, um, such as you know whether something is a string. Um, and you can see any transformations that have been carried out as well. And this is super important because this basically model.json file can be understood by Power BI but it can be also understood by all of the different Azure data services inside Azure. So we are not only you know, working as Power BI to make this sort of reusable ETL, we are collaborating with Azure Databricks, we're collaborating with Azure Data Factory, with Azure Machine Learning, and all of these different services will be able to read and write the same CDM folders that you're seeing over here, which contains this JSON definition as well as the data. So we can now have a full collaboration story across all of the different um, Azure data services. Now, um, the other side of the other angle of this is, of course, also being able to create much more complex uh, data flows. The one I've created over here and showed you guys is a very simple um, you know, example where I've gone ahead and created one entity, and I can now use this entity either inside Azure, inside Power BI. But over here, if we take a look at some data flows we've created over here, and I'm just going to change this to the diagram view, you can see how much more complex we can make these flows. So we can connect to data from multiple different uh, data sources. And then we can actually link these different um, data flows together. So different data flows can feed into data flows. Now, if I want to go ahead and refresh one of these data flows, it actually knows what the dependencies are across the different data flows. So it knows what it needs to refresh in order to be able to use this, utilize this data. And so, you know, from a data warehousing perspective, when we think about um, operationalizing our data, we don't have to worry about what processes feed into what other processes. These, these uh, data flows are completely handle all of this logic for us. So we don't have to worry about, you know, what has already been refreshed, um, you know, what depends on what, all of that logic is contained inside data flows. So we're really excited about this, you know, encouraging you guys to play around with data flows um, and, you know, loving to, uh, waiting to hear what you guys' feedback is and what you think. So I'd like to pass back to Amir now. All right, Amir, did you want to share your desktop? And you're live. You're on mute, Amir. You're on mute, though, Amir. <laughs> we see your desktop, but don't hear you. Here we go. Now there you, you are. <laughs> He's back. Thank you, Justina. So we'll see Justina again in just a moment as we talk about the uh, the that last pillar of innovation. We talked about uh, you know we talked about two pillars: the unifying sole service BI and enterprise BI. We talked about the data print Justina showed in the unified data lake. And now we're talking about AI and BI. And this is where really I've been personally um, been struggling for, for the first half of my career, trying to bring these two elements together, data mining and machine learning together with BI, and how to make it really sticky with, with data analysts and, <coughs> and, and, and business users. Um, and I think we really got it this time. 
Um, and and we'll, you'll see some pretty amazing demos from Justina in a moment. But what we are doing is we are taking um, uh, three areas of investment. We are uh, making it really easy, easy to navigate data and gain insight as you are using BI. Just just like you know, just like the uh, the, the spell check here just works when you are working inside Word. We're trying to do the same with AI within BI. And you'll see some pretty amazing example of that. Uh, we're trying to uh, enrich reported dashboards with uh, low or no code AI capabilities. And we're trying to create a seamless and contextual access to custom built ML models from across the organization. We'll see what it means for each one of those. So the first one is just making it incredibly easy to navigate data and get, get insight. And again, this is where we're using a bunch of assets uh, that we have from, from the immense uh, uh, Microsoft Research, where we have thousands of scientists working uh, on, on some of the most uh, cutting edge machine learning and natural language understanding technologies. And we're bringing all of that into Power BI to make it just so easy to go and ask questions and ask follow up questions or to go and analyze data uh, in understanding what drives the uh, different um, um, different phenomena, what are the key contributors, uh, key aspects of the uh, the mechanics or the dynamics behind the data. And uh, in addition, we are going and adding uh, the ability to go and enrich data with pre predefined uh, ML models. Justina just showed a few of those, uh, but the ability to go and uh, create these uh, this, this, uh, AI models uh, and, and use them to go and uh, train the system without any knowledge of machine learning or data science. Uh, just let the system, through a wizard, build it all for you. And lastly, the ability to connect the business user with the data, with the data scientist together, uh, for example, through uh, Python, integrated directly into the Power BI desktop. Uh, and, and to show all these things coming together, I'm going to ask Justin to come back and show how uh, AI and BI coming and in integrated experience. Cool, thanks a lot, Amir. So again, let me know when you guys are able to see my screen. And you are live. Cool. So let's jump back into data flows for a second. And let's jump back into our hotel review scenario over here. So um, what I showed you guys is how you can create an end-to-end -end data flow. But imagine that I want to, you know, take this even further. We talked about how Power Query has over 300 transformations. So let's show some of the really, really cool transformations you'll be able to do inside Power Query very, very soon using and leveraging AI insights. This is currently available inside Preview, inside Power BI, and it's going to be coming in uh, to public preview in um, you know, the, this first semester of the new year. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this AI insights button. And what I essentially want to do is I want to be able to uh, leverage machine learning to do some more with the data that I have available inside this data flow. As I've mentioned, what we have over here is you know, hotel review data. So we have a bunch of unstructured data around things such as uh, textual information about uh, the reviews that people are posting. We also have some unstructured image data around um, the data that someone, that users are um, actually posting. And well, actually, before we jump into this, I'll you know very quickly actually just show you a Power BI report that I have built beforehand. And we're gonna jump back into this report in just a second. But as you can see, if you're familiar with Power BI, this is not what my typical Power BI reports look like. I've got a bunch of text data, some images. So it's very hard to you know, actually extract insights out of this because I'm dealing with some very unstructured data. So over here under AI insights, we have two types of things. And I want to start with the cognitive services. Cognitive services are uh, services that exist inside Azure. They're sophisticated pre-trained machine learning models that you can leverage today. You can go into Azure, you can spin up let's say a texture analytics cognitive service, you can uh, you know, get your subscription key, you can uh, you know, write some code and hook it up into your application. And you, know, you, can, you can leverage these today. But for our audience, for our analysts, we want them to be able to leverage this amazing technology directly inside Power BI without having to write a single line of code. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically say, I wanna score sentiment. I'm gonna select my reviews text. And because this is preview, I still have to specify the language. 
uh, once we release, we'll be able to do language detection on the fly. And all I have to do is select invoke uh, the function. And you'll see a new Power Query step has been created um, on the right-hand side over here. And if I scroll all the way to the right, you see um, a sentiment score has been uh, generated and calculated based on the review that we have read. So for example, you know, over here we have something about the elevator being broken, and we can see that has a pretty negative sentiment. Sentiment varies from 0 to 1, so a score of 0 0.171 is pretty bad. Um, and so we can carry on and adding new types of um, cognitive services. We also have things for, let's say, doing key phrase extraction. So again, I can do the same thing. All I have to do is say, use the text field, invoke the function. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go through you know, the data row by row and extract out all of the key phrases that are meaningful um, to that particular uh, review. So again, we're doing things like removing stop words, removing common words, and figuring what, you know, what is important. So again, for our elevator was broken, you know, one of the keywords that we found was elevator. But let's say we want to do something a little bit more complex. We want to actually be able to leverage a sophisticated machine learning model has been built inside Azure by our data scientists. So we actually want to collaborate with our data scientists. We don't want to just use the out-of-the-box technology that has been brought into Power BI. And so you'll notice over here we have this um, folder for Azure machine learning models. And what this basically does is it allows us to bring in and recognize all the machine learning models that have been shared with me um, as an analyst. Generally, when data scientists and analysts collaborate, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of friction. Data scientists like to create their models inside their environments and then kind of throw it over the fence and they're done with that. Um, and so over here, what we actually are able to do as all the data scientists has to do once they've created their model is just share it inside Azure, inside, again, the portal that they're familiar with, share it with their analysts um, just by typing in their email over here. And I basically can go down into this list and I can see all of the different machine learning models that have been shared with me. And again, I didn't have to do anything to hook this up. This is, you know, we're just, you know, doing API calls on the fly to figure out what I have access to. And as an analyst, I want to use this hotel image model over here. All I have to do is say, well, point it to um, where my images sit because this uh, model, it's quite a simple model in terms of uh, the inputs, all it requests is an image URL and I can just select invoke. And now we're going to go through every single image URL that we have inside this particular data set, and we're going to send it to this Azure machine learning model that's sitting inside Azure built by our data scientists, and we're going to score each of these. And we're just going to expand this out over here so we can see what this looks like, because um, this could be multiple fields, um, depending on how you know, the, the model has been built. But uh, you know, if we just wait for a second, we'll be able to basically see what the machine learning model has assessed in every image and what kind of uh, thing it has found, because we want to build something that's a little bit more specific for hotel images. Uh, so, you know, again, we can see these are the tags that the model has come back with based on the images that it's finding. OK, so now that we've kind of cleaned up this data, we've added some structure to it. Let's see what we can actually do back in Power BI. So I've skipped a couple of steps. I've actually you know, created my data flow. I've connected to my data flow directly inside Power BI desktop. And let's take a look at what kinds of things we can do. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to reduce these um, uh, text reviews a little bit, and I'm going to unveil this amazing word cloud that I have created over here. And what this word cloud is, is actually uh, showing me all of the different key phrases that have been found inside my textual reviews. So I don't have to now sit here and read through hundreds of reviews to get an idea of what's going on. Um, in this scenario, I have five hotels. And what I can basically do is just now click on one particular hotel and automatically cross filter the top words that are appearing um, that you know, people are basically using to describe this hotel in their reviews. And I can see things like, for example, construction popping up. So that might be important for me as a hotel manager. You know, why are people talking? Well, I, I presume people are talking about construction versus construction happening in the hotel, but are they, you know, are they really unhappy about it if it's coming up in the reviews? So I can condense you know, my kind of analysis very, very quickly to the top things that are being talked about without having to read through hundreds of reviews and naturally just cross filter my data like I always do inside Power BI. Another thing I can do is, you know, we, if you remember, we actually went ahead and found the sentiment scores. So I'm just going to go ahead and plot sentiment and I'm going to plot it by hotel name over here. And now very quickly I can see uh, and get an idea of which hotels, uh, you know, people are happy with and which ones they're not so happy with. 
So we, you know, we get an idea of which hotels uh, people are posting the most kind of negative reviews about. But let's see if we can kind of get a little bit more data about this. So not just, you know, what the, you know, hotels that people are unhappy with, but let's see if we can get something a little bit more uh, qualitative around this. So over here, you know, if you remember, we actually found the image tags. We used the machine learning model to figure out what was present in every image. So I can actually just bring, instead of using um, hotel name, I can cross-correlate the sentiment scores with the images that have been found and get a very quick idea of, first of all, what kinds of things are people posting and how happy are they about posting those things? So, you know, not surprisingly, we see things, let's say, like Waterview that um, have you know, a lot of, uh, you know, generally positive reviews. And we can scroll all the way down and we can see that the most negative reviews are for some whatever reason about ACs. And so if I click on this, you know, it's kind of not surprising. We see some, you know, not so great looking ACs. If we go through our various reviews, we see things about, you know, broken ACs, loud ACs, dirty ACs. So again, very quickly, I can isolate kind of the sorts of things people are un unhappy about with my hotels. And I can actually see that um, you know, the hotel with the most negative reviews is also the one that has the most AC kind of complaints by the looks of it. So again, you know, this is kind of a fun example, let's say about hotels, but you could imagine how this could be applicable to lots of different industries, ranging, you know, from healthcare to finance to retail. Um, another really cool technology that we're bringing into Power BI is something we're calling automated ML. So I'm going to leave this data flow for a second. I'm going to jump back into my data flows. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to actually look at some CRM data. So in this particular scenario, um, what we are looking at is sales data. And I have a report that I've built over here that's looking at, um, you know, my closed sales and it's looking at my open pipeline. But as an analyst, I want to be able to provide my business users with a little bit more. I don't want to just tell them that, you know, this is what your open pipeline looks like. I want to add the predictive element to help them forecast how likely they are to meet their quota and what, the, what sort of opportunities they should be prioritizing. So I don't necessarily want to maybe hassle my data scientists to go and build their custom model. I want to do something myself inside Power BI. So with automated ML, what I can basically do is I can click on this brain icon that you can see over here, and I can add a new machine learning model. And we have lots of different models that we're bringing to Power BI. Uh, I'm going to just select the binary prediction, which basically means I want to predict uh, two potential states. In this case, I want to predict whether an opportunity has been won or an opportunity has been lost. So I'm going to select next. Um, I want to build this on top of the opportunity entity. And all I basically have to do is say, I want to use the win-loss field as my historical outcome field. So this is going to show me, um, use, basically look at historical data and show me what kind of opportunities have been won or lost. And over here, I basically select which fields I think might have had an impact on whether an opportunity has been won or lost. I don't know this for sure. Um, you know, Power BI has really got, kind of gone ahead and done a best guess for me in terms of the fields of things I should use. I can tweak these around, but it doesn't matter if you know all of these fields are not going to be useful because uh, essentially all of the magic is going to happen behind the scenes. Uh, I'm just going to give this um, a name uh, over here. I'm going to give this a label. So if it's true, we want to say it's a win. If it's a false, we want to say it's a loss. And that's it. That's all I have to do in terms of creating this machine learning model. Now, behind the scenes, what Power BI is going to do is, based on all those potential fields I've basically thrown at it, it's going to say, well, these are the fields that actually matter the most. And I'm now going to try and run 20 different predictive models. And this is the one that actually works the best. And these are the parameters for that model that fit the best. So I don't have to worry about doing any of this. Power BI does all the heavy lifting for me. And this is going to take a while because, um, you know, the model training does take a couple of minutes. So again, I'm going to fast forward a few steps and show you once, you know, basically training has been done. Uh, I get a report that told, tells me how well my model has performed, how well it is at predicting the wins and predicting the losses. And I can even see what are the most important factors in uh, basically carrying out these predictions. So for example, incident count is very important and we can actually see that well, if you have a lot of open incidents, you're much more likely to lose the opportunity, which intuitively makes sense. I can, if I'm happy with the model, I can apply it to my data set. Um, and then I can actually just use it inside Power BI. So I'm going to jump into this pipeline risk page I've created. And what you can see is I actually have this uh, predictive conversion score over here, which is 88%, which basically says, well, I've taken my predictions and I'm seeing that 
um, out of all of the different predictions, this model is predicting that 88% of the opportunities are going to be won. Um, and I can even plot this by opportunity. So here I'm actually plotting my confidence, which is coming out of my machine learning model and blending that with data that's coming out of my BI model, which so is my estimated revenue. So how valuable is the opportunity and all the different opportunities that are present over here. So very quickly, I can identify problem areas for me that I may want to focus on. For example, this opportunity has um, a high estimated revenue and a low confidence score. So um, as an analyst, I should probably make sure that my business user sees this and uh, you know, they can then make the decision to focus on this or to you know, figure out what the best actionable kind of next step would be. So this is the automated ML technology. Um, the, another really cool uh, technology that is going to be coming into Power BI and uh, into the desktop actually in February in preview is um, something we're calling the key influencers visual. So an area that we really want to be investing a lot more in is um, this concept of building AI visuals directly inside Power BI. So currently, you know, you can build, you know, your bar charts, your scatter plots, but we want to be starting to build visualizations that are driven by some, um, some insights, some intelligence behind the scenes. And these, you know, have very low barrier to entry and analysts can build them like just like any other Power BI visualization, but um, they are actually using machine learning behind the scenes. So here I've actually done a few first steps. I've um, selected the visual. You can see it's just another visual appearing in my uh, visualization pane over here. And I want to analyze the field called subscribed. So in this scenario, we're doing some campaign analysis. And uh, this is actually uh, bank data. They have run a campaign and then they want to see who subscribed uh, to their service following the campaign. So we have a field in our data model uh, of whether someone subscribed or not. And then we also have a bunch of customer attributes, such as their age, their job, marital status, and so on. So the field I want to analyze is whether someone's subscribed or not. Now I can turn to dropping fields in to see what things might potentially be impacting this field. So one field might be something like their education level. And I'm just going to drop that into explain by. And you can see immediately things have updated. We can see uh, some factors have been found based on education. And we've actually identified two types of education that are influencing subscriptions to be yes. Uh, I can drag in something like jobs, marital status. I'm just going to keep dragging these variables in and you can see that as I drag them in, the visual is actually running a new machine learning model every time on the fly by just recalculating based on the new fields. And now we can see education as treasury is actually much less of an influencer than it was at the beginning. The biggest one is actually when the job is equal to student. So when someone is a student, what we've basically found out is they're much more likely to be subscribed to the service than uh, when essentially there are uh, any other um, type of job. And we can see the average over here, and we can see how much la larger it is for students. Actually, uh, almost 29% of students subscribe to um, the service uh, following the campaign compared to the general average of 11%. The next most important factor is actually um, housing loan being no. So again, if you don't have a housing loan, you're much more likely to subscribe to the service. And I can just keep you know, jumping through these various variables um, to essentially understand what are the key influencers for this field that I am analyzing. What I can also do is not only, you know, interact with uh, this visual, I can interact with other visuals on the page and have this visual just completely uh, recalculate and rerun the machine learning model on the fly. So in this case, I clicked on landline. So now we're just looking at people who were co communicated to by landline for this, for the campaign. And now we can see actually the top factor is no longer job as student, job as retired is actually the main contributing factor. So, you know, again, we are just recalculating, we're doing machine learning on the fly, but it's so quick because it has to be, it's all contained within a visual. But now, you know, here we're just looking at one factor at a time. Imagine we want to start grouping these factors and looking at things together. So this is where this top segments part comes in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into the segment one, which is the most important one, and we'll see what this actually shows us in just a second. But what segment one basically shows us is 25% of people in segment one subscribed, which is 14 percentage points higher than the general average of 11%. And we can see that what segment one actually contains is, well, if education is tertiary, housing loan is known, um, marital single, status is single, and you don't have a personal loan, if all of these things are true, then you are much more likely to be successful with this campaign than when 
you know, when the, than the general population. So when you're running another, you know, campaign in the future, um, and you know, you're kind of looking at this data, what this analysis is telling you is this is probably a segment you should be investing in because you're going to be much more likely to be successful than the general population. And again, I can just jump through the various segments. You can see all of the variables updating uh, to see, you know, what other segments have been found by the machine learning model. Um, the final thing, just a really, really quick uh, point I wanted to make, as you know, Amir mentioned, we have uh, you know Python integration that has come into the product. Um, so you know what this basically looks like. If you're familiar with the R integration with Python, you can just build visualizations using Python directly inside Power BI. And so all I have to do is basically select uh, a number of fields I'm going to use for my analysis. I'm just going to drag these in over here. Um, uh, what I Again, I'm, because I want to do this very quickly, I'm not going to kind of explain the scenario, but I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to copy paste a Python script over here. And I want to show you guys a very quick sneak peek of a feature that's coming next month. We haven't actually haven't talked about this publicly yet, so it's quite exciting. But not only can I, you know, run this particular Python script, and you know, in this case, I'm creating a visualization that's um, not actually available, you know, in Power BI. It's a swarm plot, so. I can extend Power BI with visualizations, you know, that I might want to be able to build that I can't, you know, do natively by building these swarm plots. But you, what you'll actually see over here is we've also introduced IntelliSense directly into Power BI with the Python uh, editor. So, you know, I can actually now um, have a much easier time in being able to create my Python scripts because we have IntelliSense directly built into Power BI, which is really, really cool. I'm very excited about this. So yeah, this is uh, you know, a lot of very cool AI coming into Power BI. Again, I'd love to hear you guys' feedback, and I'm going to pass it back to Amir. Thank you, Justina. I'm going to share back my, my screen here. Um, if you guys see me. You're live. OK, great. Um, so I'm going to, you know, I know we have a bunch of questions, so I'm going to try to wrap up as quickly as possible the, uh, the uh, uh, whatever is left. Uh, so basically what you've seen is, is kind of where we're taking Power BI, we're unifying the cell service enterprise BI, data prep for uh, unified data lake for all data coming from both BI and from the data engineers all in one place, and the pervasive uh, uh, use of AI integrated into BI, which is just unbelievable, what Justina just showed you. And this really takes Power BI from this very powerful cell service tool that really is about data exploration, consumption, and in a self-service manner to a very, very complete platform that really brings everything together from data lakes to the dashboard, from self-service to uh, full enterprise governance, from paginated report to interactive exploration, from slicing and dicing to uh, AI-driven insight, from megabytes to petabytes, all in one package, which really is deployed in a single global unified BI platform that can carry every workload and every scale. And this is really going to be the key to enable data culture everywhere. So that's really the uh, the presentation. I know we have a lot of questions and we don't have a lot of time, so I want to just uh, 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 let it let my, my drive it. From here. All righty. So uh, I'll just start combing through those. Some of these you've already answered, so we, you know, we'll, we can just kind of gloss over them, but very quickly, the first one says, can sensitive information types in Office 365 data loss protection or DLP evaluate data in Power BI? So, uh, I'm not sure the, the it, audio if, if they're doing a data loss protection, DLP, my gut says no here, but they're asking, can DLP in Office 365 look at the data in Power BI to see if it's... So we are in the, we are in the process, there is, we are in the process of working with a DLP team uh, that is also serving the Office 365 to integrate DLP into Power BI so you get the very unified uh, uh, infrastructure for data loss protection. Excellent. Well, that answers that. Cool. Next one. So does everyone in the organization have to have Power BI to access reports? So you can, yeah. You know, so there are uh, to access reports. Everybody, when you say have to have, everybody can log into Power BI, uh, and 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 you know, the licensing of Power BI can come in two way, in two ways. Number one, they can have a per user license, and 
that's uh, that is the uh, $9.95 per month before the discount, or you can have it as part of the E5 Office 365 package. It's just included in that. So you can buy it standalone, you can buy it as part of the Office E5 version, or you can buy Power BI Premium, which Power BI Premium doesn't require people to have any per user license. It actually works by the, the license scores, and then the, we don't limit the number of users can access it as long as your uh, compute power is sufficient, you can support as many users as you want. Excellent. Next is, um, as new features are released in Teams, like today for frontline workers and mobile, are these data points, so they're talking about some of the new features like the scheduling, uh, planner and others, are these data points available for Power BI analysis and reporting? Uh, we have uh, about 100 connectors to various data sources. I'm not sure exactly the uh, how team stores its data, so I don't want to be very definitive, but it's it's virtually there's no piece of data to not find its, its way into Power BI. And you can awesome. one. Um, this was around the, uh, you mentioned augmented reality. It says what augmented reality, oops, skip down. What augmented reality platforms does Power BI show in? Is this targeted at Microsoft Mixed Reality and HoloLens? Yes, it is currently targeted Microsoft uh, Mixed Reality and HoloLens. Yes. Awesome. Um, do you have industry total cost of ownership analysis? Um, no, not really. Uh, we uh, the generally Power BI is getting very high marks on ease of use and, and uh, ease of administration. The fact it's a single global service yep. makes sure that you don't have fragmentation and the, co the total cost of uh, ownership is very low and the license cost is unbeatable. And I think this one uh, looks like it's related. They're asking um, what is the typical number of users for a break even to move from user model to premium? Um, so it, it's kind of fairly easy to do the math. Uh, after 500 users, you should be starting to look at the premium. Um, so basically, think about it, it's $5,000, the, the premium model, and the, the per user model is $10 per user. So you divide 5,000 by 10, you get 500. Uh, typically, you, when you go to premium, you still need a few users, several, you know, certain number of users to be still on pro for authoring. So it's probably more than 500. So if you get to 600 or so, that would be the break even point uh, to move from one to the other. Next is this is a question from London. Um, they asked, when will we get Power BI access to Exchange Online? so that we can stop running PowerShell scripts to report on, uh, I'm assuming they want to run their exchange reports against uh, using Power BI. I think there's a way to get to exchange data through Power BI, but I, I have to check it. I don't want to be definitive here. All right, so that's one we'll have to follow up on. Yes. Excellent, I can highlight that. All right, um, assuming they said, they, you're, they're assuming you're querying a reporting database, not the live database, so that it doesn't affect the live database. Well, it's your choice. It's not. It's not that. It, it's not something that we restrict. Yeah. Uh, some, we certainly have some customers that want to work on the operational data, and they're willing to take the uh, the consequences of running a bunch of reporting queries on top <laughs> of, uh, on top of. Uh, uh, operational databases, uh, but yep. I would say generally most customers like to separate their reporting databases from the operational databases, and that's just good hygiene for many people. But yeah, that's yeah. good architecture. I mean, so if for the customer who asked that, you know, that's one of the things, I used to be an architect at our uh, technology center, and that's one of the things that we try to work with customers about, what's the best way to architect your solution for something like that so you're not impacting the, the actual business system, um, but getting relevant data that's not old and stale either. So um, next, uh, let's see, for, oops. Is there guidance on migrating data from on-prem data servers to services for Power BI to access? 
So Power BI can access all the data, including on-premises data and cloud data. We have something called the gateway uh, that is a very, very efficient mechanism to connect from the cloud to your on-premises data sources. We can work live on the on-premises data, or we can cache it in the cloud. Uh, we certainly like to think that uh, it's again, it's the, the future is in the cloud, and if you have on premises, you should be having the plans yep. to move your data from the on premises to the cloud. But it's not a requirement. We have a huge number of people who still keep their data on premises. Bar BI work with on their on premises data without having to move it. Uh, people who wants to move it, there is a lot of guidance around. Uh, SQL Server and SQL Data Warehouses and Azure Data Lake on how to do these kind of transformations, but uh, don't make it, don't take it as a requirement for Power BI. You should do it because it's the right thing to do, and if you decide not to do it or it's not the right time to do it, Power BI says it's okay with us. We will work with whatever data you have on premises, no problem whatsoever. Absolutely. Um, this next one says for healthcare organizations, how is data secured on the cloud to ensure compliance with various PHI protection regular. This gets back to where you talked about how, you know, you you guys have compliance certification from a number of areas, including HIPAA and others. And they're just asking uh, how that data is secured to ensure that uh, compliance. So, so there is a, a lot in that question, and there's a whole big white paper of how we secure the data in the cloud. We have all the uh, healthcare uh, HIPAA. A certification. So first of all, it's certified. So the people who needed to look through it and through the uh, healthcare certification uh, lens, uh, did, you know, did do that, and, and we have uh, the certification. There's a white paper that we can, Mike uh, can probably send around the link to uh, yep. that describe all of it. I will say that generally all the data is always encrypted at rest. Uh, that we do have the full uh, uh, privacy certification. Our employees cannot look at your data. There is no way for them to do that. Uh, so every, you know, these are all been fully checked across the board. We have about 36 certification, uh, including certification that have deal with national security. So, yeah. uh, so it's 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 really in banking. So we it, we are covered. Uh, yeah. So I just highlighted real quickly. I wrote after it get the white paper on data security. And I get asked that a lot for a lot of the services, but you know, to your point, we do that across all of it and we encrypt at rest in transit, and then we secure and isolate the data. Yeah. Um, so they're asked, oh, the next one was, I'm almost done here with the questions. It says, does Power BI have any special features for healthcare data, like visualizations or transformations? So I would say that, uh, a lot of the work that we are doing with the machine learning team allows us to go and build some uh, uh, really unique uh, 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 algorithms that are very helpful for life sciences. We don't have specific uh, visualizations for healthcare, but the thing that the people are not, we haven't really put enough emphasis on, is the, that the visualization platform for Power BI is an open platform, which means it allows people to build their own custom visualizations. Uh, we actually have a custom visualization generator that you can, without seeing a line of code, generate your own custom visualization that is unique to your needs. Uh, we have about uh, 200 custom vi custom visuals that have been free re re in the community, built by the community, released to the community. Uh, most of them with the op uh, available as open source. Uh, mm -hmm. In addition, there are about 3,000 uh, other visuals that are created in private organizations using the same open platform. So people have been creating thousands of those visualizations embedding in Power BI, and you can create any vertical, every unique visualization you can you, you may imagine. Excellent. And, and that might be more pertinent anyways, because then they can brand them as well if they're doing their own. Exactly. Um, let's see. Can I use data flows to replace an ETL tool for interlacing between two systems? I would say that the answer is yes and no. I want to be very careful. We designed data flows for self-service ETL, just like self-service BI came in to augment BI. Um, so this is self-service ETL. I don't want to claim that data flows is now taking out the rest of ETL tools in the, uh, out of uh, out of the business. Uh, there is a lot in ETL. It's a big mature industry. Data flows are young, uh, but if you're looking for something that business analysts uh, can activate on their own and do uh, and do it in a safe way and in an efficient way uh, without having to teach them how to use Informatica, then data flows are just amazing. 
but I cannot say that data poses are good as Informatica for, for an IT professional. That's That would be an overweight for my part. No, that's awesome. So, and uh, I had one question was on where we can find date guidance for governing Power BI. And they provided a link. They said they found this document, but it was three years old. But, you know, I'm assuming that the guidance is still valid. There's a guidance. There's also a big document around enterprise, uh, you know, go enterprise governance and Power BI that is not three years old. I think maybe a year old. A year old. Uh, it's been updated just recently. So, uh, there's a big document about uh, enterprise Power BI. And, and, and we, we can, have I will send it around. Two last questions. One and the third was just asking to post a link to the healthcare white paper, which I already grabbed, uh, which I will do. So this is, can you speak about Power BI embedded, a possible media, a possible middle of the road option between pro and premium? So Power BI embedded is very similar to Power BI premium. Um, it just designed, uh, uh, so Power BI Embedded is, is an Azure service, but it really has the exact same feature set of Power BI Premium. Uh, Power BI Premium can be used as embedded, not the other way around. Um, it has a very rich API, set of API that allow you to go and embed Power BI with all the richness of visualization inside your application and allow your application to control from the outside the behavior of Power BI visualization inside, Power BI visualization and report inside. Um, it is, uh, when you take the Azure service, you can scale it dynamically up and down very easily. It's a per minute or per second charging model. Um, uh, but it is Power BI, as you know, virtually every feature of Power BI is available in Power BI embedded. Uh, it, the API services are difficult. It is not, this is just a different uh, packaging of the same things. And the very last question we have, um, this was interesting. Uh, using, is it possible to use Power BI on Office 365 tenant activity around users or products that are using Power BI? I know we're doing a lot around, you know, other services in the cloud using Power BI um, to do reporting, but they're asking specifically around users or products that are using Power BI. So we do have, so the answer is yes. I uh, I know already that we have some Power BI uh, content packs and applications yeah. that, are, that are already analyzing the Office 365 activities that were released by the Office 365 folks. Um, and uh, and I'm sure you can connect additional data sets and data yeah. sources. So Power BI, in fact, we are using Power BI to analyze Power BI itself. And with the very few administrators, Power BI reports that analyze what's going on inside Power BI. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions we have. I, I, I First of all, I want to thank you, Amir, Justina, and Christian um, for your time today. Uh, tomorrow, just as a quick reminder, we are going to be continuing our series at 12 noon Eastern, and we will be looking at protecting high-risk healthcare and life science data with identity and conditional access. So be on the look for that. Uh, if you uh, looking for uh, information around that, share it with your colleagues. This afternoon, I will post the recording of today's presentation along with the one link to the white paper. Um, and then I don't know, uh, Amir, am I able to share the slides that you were presenting today? Yeah, we can. We will be able to share the slides. Yes. Yeah. So, well, they'll send those over to me, and then I'll add those to the post as well. And all that will be able. You'll be able to find on our. Microsoft Healthcare and Life Sciences blog that is up here on the tech net, or excuse me, the techcommunity.microsoft.com. So I want to thank everybody again for joining. Michael Gennati here, and again, special thanks to our guests, Amir, Justina, and Christian, and to all of you who've tuned in. I want to thank you. Have a great day. Take care, and see you tomorrow. Ciao.